All right there. Hello, Founder fans. Jason, right here. Thank you for coming to Founder of the Day Study Hall, where we're going to answer your questions about the American Revolution and, I don't know, maybe something else. Depends what you ask. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, as people roll in here, please hit like on your way in. And if you're new here, definitely subscribe. Just American Revolution all the time over here. Uh, anyway, uh, I also want to tell you real quick, many of you have joined our Discord channel. I put a link in the description below. They're only good for 24 hours. So if you want to join a really fun conversation with other like-minded fans and students of the American Revolution, uh, if you're not familiar, Discord is kind of like a social media platform, except it's my server. So it's just founder of the day social media. So if that interests you, check that out. Um, also, uh, let's start moving right along. Uh, if anyone has any questions, like I said, that's what this particular thing is for. I'm still a little bit nervous at the beginning of study hall. All my other videos I'm ready for, I prepare for them. But this one in particular, uh, never sure what we're going to talk about though. I did get an interesting question over on the discord channel from misfit today. Um, asking about Dr. Joseph Warren and why they went so, um, for those of you who are not familiar, Dr. Joseph Warren was one of the most important patriots in revolutionary Boston. When the American Revolution was getting underway, he was a physician. Uh, he's the one who inoculated John Adams for smallpox. He, uh, although he started fairly low, I don't want to say low, he was from a middling family. He made his way to the upper echelons of society. And uh, when the war broke out, he found himself kind of in the middle of both worlds, but became such an important patriot that... He was chosen as the major general in charge of the Revolutionary Army before Washington showed up uh, during the Battle of Bunker Hill, where he famously did not take his command and decided to serve on the front lines at Bunker Hill and unfortunately was killed, uh, but became a martyr to the cause at that point. And by then, he had already, he was the one who sent Paul Revere on all of his midnight rides. He's the one who wrote the Suffolk Resolves that when Paul Revere brought them to the First Continental Congress, changed the direction of the First Continental Congress and arguably uh, all of American history. Just an amazingly important American founder. Uh, and, and when he died at Bunker Hill, his body was found by the British and on multiple occasions, uh, kind of grossly... Uh, m m maligned. They they did terrible things to his corpse. Uh, and, and, and Misfit had asked, why would they do that? Um, and I have this fabulous book here. Uh, I probably should have put a link in the description below for you to buy it, but uh, this is by a friend of mine, Christian Despigna, who I, I, I call a friend of mine. I be we became friendly after he was already published this book and I started Founder of the Day, and I'm very fortunate to know him. Uh, he wrote this amazing book, uh, a founding martyr about Dr. Joseph Warren and his importance to society. And I did want to read a quote here I found. I didn't have a lot of time. The short answer to why they destroyed uh, Warren's body is because he was such so emblematic of this revolution that only two months before had broken out into violence. Uh, or there had been violence earlier than that, but it was only two months out of, after the Battle of Lexington and Concord and a war actually broke out. And many reasons they... They blamed him. So I'm going to read this passage from the book. Again, it's an amazing book. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, not just for not just for about um, Joseph Warren, but actually he does, you know, Christian Despigna took 20 years to write this book and research this book. And he does a great job of putting you in the mindset of revolutionary Boston and, and, and demonstrating the difference between class stru structure in, in Boston at the time. But I'm going to read you this quote specifically about the death of Joseph Warren. Spoiler alert, he's passed away at this point. Um, and, and he does use a big word here. I'm not sure how to say it. Uh, following their Pyrrhic victory on Breed's Hill, a small group of seething redcoats circled the body of the, quote, murdered worthy Dr. Warren, end quote, adorned in the conspicuous finery so out of place among the other corpses. Again, uh, Warren was a physician. He was of the upper class at this point in his life, but he decided to serve on the front lines with your average run-of-the-mill Joe. That's why his clothing stands out so much. The doctor's attire was now covered with blood, as was his right hand. Warren had been the hallmark of everything British soldiers despised, and now they vented their fury upon him. They removed his clothing and looted his personal items, including his cherished Bible, his sword, and the letters containing sensitive information tucked away in the fold of his waistcoat. Probably should have left that behind when he served on the front lines. As his body lay sprawled on the ground, his ashen complexion stained by a stream of blood, his majesty's soldiers repeatedly bayoneted his corpse in a violent butchering. Lieutenant James Drew of the Royal Navy, it was later claimed, 
returned to the readout, walked over to Warren's body and spat in his face before cutting, quote, off his head and committing every act of violence upon his body. What was left of Warren remained on the field overnight. Quote, he was buried hastily in trenches on the morning after the battle, end quote. His mutilated corpse tossed unceremoniously into a shallow ditch in a mass grave of slain and murdered patriots. So sorry to be a bummer right off the bat. Uh, yeah, but as I said, this is to answer your questions that someone did ask about Joseph Warren. So as you saw in there, uh, he symbolized, Joseph Warren symbolized this whole uprising. These awful patriots who just did not appreciate all they got from the king and parliament and being a member of the empire of Great Britain. Uh, that is how most of these soldiers felt, especially, uh, you know, because this so especially as soldiers who were paid to defend their country, you know, you see a lot, you know, oftentimes you see similar things say, you know, pay, soldiers who come back from war in America nowadays, you know, generally speaking, uh, are very attached to the United States and are unhappy when people uh, not necessarily criticize it, you know, they're fighting for the freedom to speak freely, but uh, attack it, so to speak, verbally. And Warren was that kind of person from their perspective. Now, from an American history perspective, he is a hero and a martyr. <laughs> but, of course, that's, you know, when you objectively look back at history, you, you know, when you look at both sides, uh, it can be tough. <laughs> uh, you know, to sympathize with the British who are, you know, beheading corpses. But uh, that is. And Matt, coming through, as always, with Peerlick. And I, I, and I closed the book and I lost the page. Uh, but it was like P-Y-R-R. So it's a weird word. Anyway, another shout out to Christian Despigno, one of the first people who came and did an interview over the summer on this channel last year and who, uh, I, I don't know if he's watching, but I plan on reaching out to this afternoon because I'm about to start, I've, I've already started reaching out to people to do more interviews over here. I've got a lot of exciting people come up. I don't want to spoiler, spoil it yet, but we're about to start having some real serious, amazing historians come over to Founder of the Day to speak directly to you. And I am extraordinarily excited and grateful for every single one of them. Um, so many of their friends and colleagues died. Um, oh, the Redcoats, Matt. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, these are people who traveled the world fighting for the king. Uh, and here they are with actual Britons trying to throw off the king. No, stop it. Although, granted, this was even before Independence was talking. What's interesting about Joseph Warren is he... He never even heard rumors of independence. You know, he died in, uh, what was it, June of 1775, a year and a half beforehand. And I guess I'm sure there were, like, discussions of it, but it was not taken seriously at this point at all by almost anyone. Maybe Sam Adams, who was super close with uh, Warren. And in fact, now, I don't remember exactly who did it. I don't think it was actually Sam Adams, but several patriots would later go. might have been Sam Adams, would later go and dig up Warren's body and give him a proper burial. Uh, so there is that I should end with. Uh, I don't know if I could say it ends well, <laughs> but uh, it certainly ends like that. Uh, let's see. Uh, like I said, you guys, any questions, any answers, anything you want, uh, feel free to hit like. Um, <laughs> well, I should say definitely hit like. That'd be amazing. It's the best possible thing you could do to help out this channel. Um, I did want to read something uh, while, while we're waiting patiently for you guys to. Uh, I am a little slow on my YouTube comments sometimes, and I do apologize, especially in the last two weeks with the holiday season, as you can imagine. But a while ago, I, po I, I made a video about uh, John Carroll, who was the first American archbishop. He was a brother of Charles Carroll of Carrollton, who was a signer of the Declaration of Independence uh, and a cousin of Charles Carroll, not of Carrollton, who also signed the Declaration. Uh, the Carroll family was from Maryland. Maryland was a Catholic hotspot uh, in the world, essentially. Well, I guess, you know, Europe. But other than that, uh, in North America, no, I shouldn't even say that because Canada was Catholic because all the French up there. Either way, in the British American colonies, the 13 colonies, uh, uh, Maryland was Catholic, and most of the important Catholics came from Maryland. And a lot of the reason we have freedom of religion in the First Amendment was because the Catholics had uh, uh, not only been such an important part of the revolution, but, but proven that, you know, you shouldn't be suppressing people uh, just because they're Catholic. I mean, uh, I, I will say certain Jews played a role in that also, um, and, you know, all sorts of 
I don't want to say minorities. Each different colony and then state had different minority denominations of religions uh, down there. Now, I, I'm not a religious expert in any fashion, but I wanted to read uh, a quote someone left me yesterday uh, about John Carroll. And, oh, to sum up, John Carroll would go up to Canada. He was one of the people who tried to recruit Canada to join the American Revolutionary cause. Didn't work, but since he was Catholic, they thought he might help. Um, but after the revolution ends, there's a whole upheaval in religion in the United States. I mean... Half of the people in America were part were Anglican, a.k.a. the Church of England. And that was a little tough once you throw off the mother country. So there were many, many people trying to kind of reorganize and reassess what religion meant in the United States and how the structure of uh, religious organizations, I'll say, in America um, were set up. Uh, John Carroll ends up being appointed by uh, the, uh, I, I believe the Pope, actually the Pope, because I think the Pope has to be the one to approve this kind of thing, uh, approved him. And, and John Carroll becomes the first archbishop in the United States of America. And I bring this up because, again, I'm not a religious expert, and I try to be super so cautious about the words I use, because I don't want to offend anyone by making a careless error. Um, but I have. <laughs> Although the person who left this comment uh, seems to be very, very nice, because uh, they go under the title of metaphysical. Uh, and metaphysical says, nice video, thanks. Uh, just a tip. The Society of Jesus, a.k.a. the Jesuits, is a religious order, not a sect or denomination. An order is basically a group of Catholics who emphasize one particular aspect of Catholicism, like education, or working with the poor, or devotion to prayer, etc. So, uh, when I said the Jesuits, I'm, I, accidentally, I mistakenly called the Jesuits a, uh, a sect of Catholicism, and I've been corrected. Uh, it's an order, and as he says here, an order is not a de like a denomination, not a separate part of Catholicism. It is just a group of Catholics who focus on one particular issue. So thank you, Metaphysical, for bringing that up to me. I really, 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 really appreciate it. Um, so uh, let me pop back here, see if you guys are commenting. Oh, we got some comments. Is his grave marked now? Um... Great question. Uh, Tom Proctor, find a grave. Uh, well, there it is. <laughs> Thank you, Tom Proctor. Yes, so um, I believe in the 1850s, uh, y yes, so Warren was, like I said, uh, a after the British evacuated Boston in March of 1776 uh, and went to fight the war everywhere else, uh, the, the Patriots took Boston back over. And like I said, I think it was Sam Adams, but I'm not a thousand percent sure, but a handful of patriots did go find the body of Dr. Warren, because again, he was an emblem of everything the British hated. He was also a symbol of everything the Americans loved. Like, the Continental Congress, he had never gone to Philadelphia, and although the only the people from Massachusetts, and our, I think one person from New Hampshire had ever actually met Joseph Warren in person, they all knew his name, and they all knew who he was. Uh, be, mostly because the Suffolk resolves, like I said, went to that first Continental Congress and just changed everything. But yeah, as Matt's saying, his bones were removed. Uh, first, they went and grabbed him from the mass grave. Uh, I believe they identified him from, from his teeth. Not that they had really dental records at the time, but he was a physician and he had a, uh, he was friendly with other physicians who helped identify him for several markers so they could confirm it was his body. And then they put him, they buried him, and then it was in the mid-1800s, I think in 1858, is what I read, because I, I just saw it when I was skimming through the book. Uh, they, it was a grandson of his, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but someone with the last name Warren, uh, another Dr. Warren, did move his bones to, uh, I believe, a mausoleum, if I'm not, again, if I'm not mistaken... It's a little out of my purview after they start moving bones a <laughs> hundred years later. Uh, so I'm not a thousand times sure. But yes, I do know as Tom, as uh, Mr. Proctor has done for us, Troy, um, he definitely was reburied and he was moved on several occasions. And that's not uncommon. As cities grew over the years, you find bones being moved and removed on many, many occasions. Um, that's why... That's so why you gotta be like George Washington, buy a huge piece of land and bury yourself somewhere on it. <laughs> Anywho, uh, I should send a Discord invite to Chris. You know what, Matt? It's interesting. I actually thought uh, about inviting uh, uh, several of the people. Basically, everyone I'm gonna interview, I'm gonna give the invite to. Uh, uh, hopefully, they can come over and participate a little bit. Uh, I will say, if you enjoyed this channel, uh, um, Mr. Despigna and uh, another gentleman whose name escapes me, 
They are members of the, the, they've started the Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society. I believe it's called, I think the word historical is in there. I'm, I'm going to pull it up because, man, I am just, Sunday morning. Usually I'm doing these at night. I have a whole day behind me. <laughs> uh, Joseph Warren Historical Society. And I bring it up because they've started a YouTube channel similar to this. Now, they do focus mostly on Joseph Warren, uh, but they have many guests on there. And it is, they do a great job um, of everything. Uh, so I am going to put, I'm going to put this here, a link to the doctor. Yes, Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society. I am going to paste this right in here. Will it let me paste it? I know I've had trouble before. Yes, because I fixed my things and I'm finally figuring this out. Um, pull my stuff back up here. Uh, and I am going to go to... I'm actually going to pull up the thing because I, I really, really appreciate what they do over there. I watch them there all the time. Uh, Joseph Warren Historical Society. Um, it's Hillsdale College. I am. Here we go. They've been doing it for a while now. I don't want it to play. I'm going to pause it. I want to go to their headquarters. Uh... Yeah, they started pretty well after me. It's fairly new, uh, but I am going to take their channel and paste that in here. And you know what? They have they got 50, they have 63 subscribers. Let's see if we get that up to 80 subscribers. Let's do that for them. I'm promoting them. They don't even know I'm doing this. <laughs> like I said, I was planning on call, calling Christian later today, and I'm going to be like, hey, man, I was talking about you this morning. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, they're doing wonderful things. Like I said, if you enjoy this channel, you'll like what they're doing over there. Um, they also... They do more interviews than just chatting like I do. So they've had just a ton of authors that they're friendly with that have gone over there. So if you like this, uh, please come back here also, but definitely check out what they're doing over there. Um, and while you're here, before you go, hit like. <laughs> um, Roger Williams. Is that, uh, is that the gentleman's name? Maybe? Um... Uh, no, Randolph G. Flood, Mr. Flood, uh, is up there with Mr. Despigna. Um, as for Roger Williams, uh, of Rhode Island? <laughs> I'm not sure where you're going with that, man. I'm going to take a quick sip of water here. Uh, unfortunately, Roger Williams is a fairly common name. Shout out to Liberty & Co. Make him a favorite cup. <laughs> Anyone new here? Who well, hasn't been to Trivia Night? Liberty & Co. is an amazing company that sponsors Trivia Night. Not this particular <laughs> episode, but still fine, just fine. Like I said, uh, study hall is for you guys to ask questions, so please ask any questions. Uh, although I will say, <laughs> if you ask them, if you can be a little more specific than Matt has been. Roger does videos. You know, I, I feel really guilty. I've never spoken with the other gentleman uh, in person. And it says on their website that the other person who at least runs the organization is Randolph Flood. His name may be Roger Williams. That does sound familiar. And now I'm super embarrassed that I brought it up and I don't, I don't know his name. Like I said, uh, Christian Despigner has been nothing but nice to me this whole time. And I'm being very mean to him not knowing his teammate's name. <laughs> um, but they have, they've had... Uh, I want to say dozens of guests on there. Yeah, no problem, Trey. If you like, if you like what I'm doing, you'll like what they're doing. They're very, very, pretty, very specific. Uh, although some of their guests, you know, it's not just Joseph Warren, but they're kind of specific to Massachusetts. At least the videos I've seen, I've probably seen ten of their videos at this point, um, give or take. I'm not sure how often they come out with them, but uh, yeah. Yeah, they're coming out with them pretty frequently. But, um, yeah, they do tend to focus on uh, Massachusetts and the, the greater Massachusetts region. Um, well, here we're all over the place. <laughs> um, and now I'm looking up at their pictures. Yeah, they have, they have just a ton of great, great interviews. Great interviews. They, I'll, 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 I will say, you know what? I did. Uh, they spoke to a young woman a few months back from the... Uh, American, the museum, the American Independence Museum in Essex, Massachusetts, which used to be the Gilman House, 
uh, a signer of the U.S. Constitution, grew up in the house. Uh, I had been there a few months, uh, two years ago, I think. So that's technically in Portsmouth, Mass. Uh, I'm sorry, Essex, Massachusetts. No, wait, Exeter, Massachusetts, New Hampshire. Oh, let's try this one last time. I got, I got it this time. Exeter, New Hampshire. It's a really cool place. I highly recommend. If you're in the area, definitely go visit it. They have a bunch of cool artifacts there, um, including one of the Purple Hearts George Washington gave out, which is really cool. <laughs> uh, let's see. Is this? No, that's my phone. Why am I looking at? Anyway. If you guys have questions, this is the time. I know I'm rambling a little bit. Again, it's study hall. I, you know, I did want to throw out there. I'm about to put up on my website later today. I am going to start doing um, tutoring and consulting. So if you or anyone you know or have it, are or have any children uh, or you're working on a project or you have a student who needs to catch up or people are like learning to homeschool right now. Um, if you have anyone who needs help, specifically in the American Revolution, but American history at large, um, uh, feel free to email me at Jason at contact at founder of the day. Uh, I'm like I said, I've created the page for my site. I got to put it up on founder of the day.com. Once it's there, we'll go a little further into it. Um, uh, yeah, but so feel free to contact me if that's the kind of thing that interests you. Um, I figure at this point I've done enough study about the American revolution. I can help people. Uh, Ginger, thank you. Let me know if you have a question. I mean, like I said, giving out free answers right now here. <laughs> I assume one day it will get a little longer. Oh, Troy, that would be super helpful. I would really appreciate that. Like I said, anyone who has, you know, students trying to fall behind, trying to study for AP questions, anyone who's learning for college, having problems with university, you know, I've been I've been at it for a while. I'm sure you can know. Uh, but I don't want to be too much self-promotion. I want to see what Matt posted here. Uh, what is this? <clears throat> Excuse me. Put that back up. 10crucialdays.org. Super cool. January 3rd. Is that... Was that today? Is that right now? <laughs> um, I'm not entirely sure what it is. I'm trying to read as I talk. A virtual wreath laying at the Princeton battlefield. Oh, great. Uh, did George Washington design the Purple Heart? No, I don't believe so. Well, I don't think George Washington designed it. There were a few men who, there were, I think, three people during the American Revolutionary War who received a purple heart. I'm trying to pull up an image. Um, <clears throat> and then it disappeared until like, just before, until around World War II. And now it's back and everyone's familiar with it, but it disappeared for like 150 years. Uh, he gave it off to three people. Um, I was actually looking at one just the other day. Uh, it was, okay, the, the original Purple Heart designed as the badge of military merit. I don't see him designing it. But it was, it was something George Washington gave, specifically, you know, George Washington gave it to you. I don't think he designed it or sewed it himself. That's an interesting question, uh, Ginger. I am going to look into that. Uh, Arlington Cemetery says L'Enfant designed it. Oh, that's interesting. It doesn't really surprise me. Uh, he was at the time serving with the army and he did design, he did do a portrait of George Washington or at least a silhouette, though unfortunately that's been lost to history. Um, but that makes a lot of sense. Uh, cool, very cool. Um, yeah, I'll look into it. I, I'm trying to find the names of the gentlemen. Recipients. Oh, okay. There were four. I was close. Uh, May 3rd, 1783. Uh, William Brown from Connecticut. And Elijah Churchill, who I believe was from Long Island. Uh, September, June 10th, 1783. Daniel Bissell of the Connecticut line. And June 30th, 1783. 
uh, Louis Marnie of Colonel Hazen's 2nd Canadian Regiment. Very interesting. Moses Hazen, one of the Jewish founding fathers. Uh, and I will pull this up. Uh, can I can I zoom in? Come on, zoom in. Okay, it's a little blurry, but I'll pull it up here. Uh, if you can see it behind me. Let's see, I'll move my head. Nope. Ugh. Screwing things up. There, move my head. That is the first Purple Heart of Merit. All right, I'm going to pop back in here, though. I feel weird. <laughs> I feel weird and out of place. So, pretty cool, I think. Um, stop saying, um... So, yeah, I don't think he designed the Purple Heart, but he was... I will look into that for you, Ginger. And i uh, come back next week. I'm going to write it down. Purple Heart. I'm going to write it down. I'm going to do a little research into that. Because that's a really interesting question. Great. Thank you, Ginger. Make sure you like and hit the notification bell uh, so that the internet tells you <laughs> when I'm going live or else, you know, it's hard to know. Uh, great. Cool. Very cool. Um, oh, I should note, if you guys want something else to, you want more content to consume, uh, I don't have the connections yet, but I was just uh, speaking to uh, Jesse Sir Filippi of the Skyler Mansion in Albany, who may or may not be one of the people I'm interviewing coming up uh, uh, last night, and they are putting together a, tw a thing for Twelfth Night. Um, they do a whole series of fun stuff about the American, or for the uh, Schuyler family, but uh, also celebrating Christmas, but kind of doing it in a 18th century kind of way. So uh, they are putting something out on Tuesday. Uh, they're putting something out on Tuesday uh, to help you prepare. Again, I, I haven't gotten all the information yet, and we were just kind of texting real quick. Um, but basically, they're going to put out a few instructional videos on Tuesday for how to celebrate Twelfth Night. And then on Wednesday, they're having a live virtual stream. So that will be fun. Um, thank you, Genesis. I really appreciate you uh, coming here and hanging out. <laughs> Let me know if you have any questions or anything I can talk about. I don't know everything, but I know a significant amount. <laughs> I put a few decades of research in, although Ginger certainly got me with the Purple Heart question. <laughs> That's all right. It's fun. We're all here to learn together. Um, uh, you know what? See something. See what I can find for us. Do to do, do to do, do, do. Yeah, none of this seems to be the actual mansion. All right, I tried. Um, I am going to pull up founders online. Let's see if we can find out. Oh, hey Ashley. Uh, was there a certain event that led to more people in the colonies calling for independence? It seems at first people were just angry at the British for not being treated as equal, plus the taxes. Um, uh, oh, Tom, uh, yeah, great. So was mine. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming. I'm glad you enjoyed it. If there's anything you want to know. Uh, oh, hey, Jeremy, we're just talking. We're answering questions. Right now, about to answer. I want to answer uh, Ashley's questions. Thank you, Tom. I'm glad you enjoy it. I really enjoy making it. Uh, today was the Battle of Princeton. Yes, that's probably why it says it on the, the thing you sent. Nice. Um, now, Ashley asked, was there a certain event that led to more people in the colonies calling for independence? So there were a few stops along the way. When the, the war breaks out at Lexington and Concord, there's like not really independence on anyone's mind. Well, actually, what many most of the revolutionaries were fighting for was their, quote, rights as Englishmen. Because they believed that Great Britain was the most free country in the entire world. And with their constitutional monarchy, in many fashions, it was close. Uh, you know, there were republics in the Netherlands. Uh, um, Geneva was kind of a republic, although France more or less told them they could be. <laughs> um, I, uh, so they weren't necessarily fighting for independence. They were fighting to get the rights that they thought they already had under the English Constitution. Now, the, 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 the Battle of Lexington and Concord 
breaks out right as the leading founders are returning to Philadelphia for the Second Continental Congress. The First Continental Congress ended in the fall of 1774, and in the spring of 1775, they said if we don't if we don't get our grievances addressed, we're going to meet back up. So they were on their way to meet back up, and you look at uh, what was it? Patrick Henry literally stops what he's doing. On he's he's on his way to Philadelphia, hears about Lexington and Concord, stops, turns around, and goes back <laughs> to Virginia to chase off the royal governor. <laughs> um, so that's the scene when the war breaks out. And when they get to the Second Continental Congress, they're like, oh man, what do we do? Boston, what are you doing? <laughs> New England, why are you fighting a war? This was not the plan. And then the New England people were like, I mean, what are we supposed to do? Like, Concord, man. <laughs> and, and to be fair, you know, John Hancock and Paul Revere, I'm sorry, John Hancock and Sam Adams get to the Second Continental Congress and they're like, they were chasing us. We ran away while the war literally ran from Lexington. That's who they were going to get. Well, they were going to get powder, but that's who they thought they were going to get. And they ran away from the British as the war is literally breaking out. So they get to the Second Continental Congress like, what do we do? What do we do? And following the sage advice of revolutionary hero John Dickinson, they wrote the Olive Branch Petition, which is arguably the most overlooked document of the American Revolution. Even I overlook it because I don't include it in my when I say the four major documents, and I've been actually considering adding it as a fifth, because this was a document written to the king. Most other times, and, and they while they would write to Parliament, don't get me wrong, most of the times they would write three letters, one to the House of Represent, uh, House of Lords, one to the House of Commons, both in Parliament, and one to the King. And this time they wrote to the King, and they said, hey, we're your subjects, please help us. You know, your, your, your Parliament has lost its mind, it is repressing our freedoms, and now they have sent soldiers here that are now actively attacking us. What, please... Your Majesty, save us. And the king writes back, well, the colonies are in open war. They need to be violently suppressed. <laughs> to be fair to the king, it was a matter of days between, you know, it took a few months for the boat to sail over with the Olive Branch petition. And it's, it's crazy. I think it's like two days later or the next day, the king declares the colonies are in open rebellion. And then the next day, the Olive Branch petition is put on the table in front of them. It's just one of those sad coincidences of history. I mean, uh, you know, if you wish America was still Great Britain, I guess it's one of those sad coincidences. So the king declaring the colonies an open rebellion was one of the major aspects of the drive towards independence because what other options did the colonies have? To just, now it was either just give up, get hung if you're one of the leaders, uh, and let the king and parliament make whatever laws they want, as they said uh, in uh, when they repealed the Stamp Act, in all cases whatsoever. So this is the situation in the summer of 1775. You have, uh, uh, you know, when when the olive when they find out that the king no is declared you an open rebellion. So they spend the fall of 1775. Preparing for war, putting together, we discussed recently, the Marines, organizing the Navy, uh, kind of reorganizing the, the Army again. Over that summer, they organized the hospital and medical departments. Uh, you know, so... And that's where... And then, so that's what they do for that uh, uh, fall there. And then we hit January of 1776, where at this point, the Siege of Boston has gone on for almost an entire year. They know that the king is about to send over the might of the royal navy and the royal army they already have silas dean working with the uh, silas dean working for the secret committee uh trying to get funds from france but without really any public support from the united states and in january of 1776 thomas paine publishes common sense uh and common sense is a fairly brief pamphlet uh it's uh, uh, and it essentially says, why would a little island north of Europe govern the entire continent of North America? 
and among other things, uh, he lists a bunch of the grievances, talks about how the king is not ever coming to help us. The king has declared us in open rebellion. He will never help us. It is either we destroy every soldier he sends from around the world, mind you, from the most powerful military the world had ever seen, arguably. <laughs> you know, there was certain, at the time, even in China, bigger, more powerful militaries, though the Navy, the Navy was the powerful thing. You could argue that Spain's military Navy had been more powerful, but it wasn't anymore. Not the point. So, just to reiterate what I said in a really long fashion, uh, the war breaks out as the Continental Congress is meeting. They send an olive branch saying, please help us, king. The king responds with, nope, we're coming to get you. And then, without any other options left, Thomas Paine publishes Common Sense, which Common Sense sold 300,000 copies at a time where there was 2.5 million people 500,000 of whom were slaves, so 2 million free people. Uh, and I'm not great at math, but those are huge numbers. Because <laughs> we have like 250 times that many people now. So whatever, I we should have my calculator out. <laughs> I used to know these numbers, but you know, math isn't my thing. Uh, I'm not going to do it, but a lot. A huge percentage of the population. There's one out of... Again, I'm going to do the math. Because it's going to bother me. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, 200, 2 million divided by 300,000 equals... I don't... 6.6. .6. Okay, I don't know what I'm doing. I can't do math on camera. You get it. 300,000 copies was a humongous percent of their population. And because of that, everyone was like, kind of too late. Because we talked about recently, John Jay, even as late as March of 1776, when the British are clearing out of Boston, still holding out a hope for reconciliation, but going back to New York, realizing, okay, we're going to have to build an independent government pretty soon. All right, uh, lots of questions coming in. Great. Uh, would the king have actually read it and replied or have his people? Well, you know... Mm -hmm. Just like George Washington had Alexander Hamilton and John Lawrence uh, and had people for that, the king had people for that. But the most noteworthy correspondence would have made it to his table. And this is the type of thing that would have made it to his table. Unfortunately, like I said, it would have made it to his table two days after his declaration that they were in open rebellion. And like many monarchs and many dictators and many human beings in general, have King George III would have had a little bit of trouble saying he was wrong so quickly. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Thank you, Jeremy. One in six or seven would have bought common sense. Right. Uh, uh, yes, one out of like six and a half people. Which, to put that in perspective, we have 350 million Americans today. Uh, Jeremy, do the math. Put that in perspective for us. <laughs> I mean, two times... A hundred, you know, so that would, you know, we're talking about hundreds of millions of copies. Of, no, we're not. I can't do the math. I'm sorry I can't do the math. <laughs> You're here for the history, not for the mathematics, I assure you. <laughs> and Matt makes a good point. They were passed around and would have been read aloud by family. You know, a family would have bought it. I, I shouldn't say read aloud. Most people could read, but if a family bought it, would have kept it in the family. The whole family would have read it, would have been passed around, would have been put in subscription libraries and things of that nature. Uh, Julia Smith. Hi, I wrote you a while ago about, uh, hi, I wrote you a while ago asking about Oliver Wolcott and you told me about Oliver Wolcott Jr. I was looking for that video, but didn't find it. I would love to learn more about him. Oh, oh, Oliver Wolcott Jr. Did we make a video? I, you know what? I might've written about Oliver Wolcott Jr. And when I write an article each week, it comes in the weekly live video we do Wednesday nights. Uh, which means I would have spoken about him uh, at, during one of those weekly wrap-ups. And I may have confused that weekly wrap-up with one of my regular videos. So I do apologize if I had told you that. Uh, oh, and did Matt pull it up for you? Okay, Matt, Matt, Matt coming through. Let me see. Let's see if I can pull it up. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> uh... 
Okay, I'm pulling this back up. I'm just seeing if we can paste and copy. Did it work? Oh, it's gonna pop up. I wanna pause it? Don't want me yelling at me while I'm yelling at you. Oh, oh wow. Okay, so Matt found a video from Feb. Oh wow, it looks so bad and it's from less than a year ago. I've only been doing this about a year and a half and I've come a long way, if I do say so myself, in how the videos look. Uh, because I am going to copy this like Matt did if it didn't work. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, did the link work? I don't know, Matt, if it did or did not. I'm doing it anyway just to double up to help out. Thank you for your help because I just copied what you wrote and pasted it and then copy and paste it again. Um, this is old. <laughs> I look terrible. I don't have a collar on. I think I'm wearing the same hat, though. Look at that. I definitely still have that law firm of John Adams t-shirt on, though. I might actually have it on right now. Um, let's see. I'm missing some stuff. I'm missing some stuff. Uh, Troy, Lavella, you can see Jason's calculator displaying. You monkey. <laughs> yeah. It, oh, and the number is big. Um, 50 million. That's right. Jeremy Galloway. Thank you for bringing it up. Thomas Paine sold the equivalent of 50 million copies of Common Sense. Uh, to, in today, it's like if so, an author today wrote 50 million copies, which we live in an area where people have tens of millions of subscribers. Not a lot of people have 50 million subscribers on their YouTube channel, you know? So it's, it's just literally everyone read this and it catapulted Thomas Paine from essentially a nobody to super famous, uh, and a really important member of world history because he would go on and play. Uh, an extraordinarily important and underappreciated part in the French Revolution, as would Marquis de Lafayette. Uh, it is a uh, founder of David. Right. So that is Oliver Wolcott. I can, in a second, uh, talk a little bit about Oliver Wolcott, if you want. Absolutely. I'll pull up, just to remind me so I don't miss anything, uh, pull it up on my website here. Uh, another important factor about the Common Sense Convo, what was the percentage of people that knew how to read? Jeremy Galloway, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, there is... Uh, there is this common misconception that Americans in the American Revolution couldn't read. Um, the thing is, easily 90% of the people in, the, in, in, in British North America during, leading up to, during, and after the American Revolution could read. Most people could read. Probably upwards of 95% could read. And there's a really good reason for this. Many of the early people who traveled to North America did so to evade religious persecution. You know, the Puritans, like I said, the Catholics hanging out in Maryland, um, or specifically the Jesuits, as we talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, many, several, several people came to America for that reason. People came to make money too, don't get me wrong. But there was something that had to happen. If you wanted to be a good person, you, you had to read the Bible. Everyone could read the Bible. And in fact... Women are, are, of course, were underappreciated for their role in society at the time. Don't get me wrong. But they're currently underappreciated for the, the, the important role they had in society as educators. Because women, uh, as, uh, specifically as mothers, were meant to educate the children in how to read. And they had to learn how to read to read the Bible. And if they couldn't read the Bible, they'd probably be going to hell. Uh, so every woman, man, woman, and child learned how to read so they could read the Bible. Um, so uh, that is a great point. And, it, you know, uh, how do you say, um, tenacity, not tenacity, um, intuition would make us think. And I've, I've, I've thought the same thing at points in my life. Uh, so please don't feel bad. No wrong questions here. Uh, but we would think it's natural to think that people, not as many people could read. So it was a bigger percentage of the pop reading population. But the truth is most, most people could read, um, it was like today, not quite as bad as today. You know, by bad, I mean, you know, nowadays if someone can't read, we're like, really? Back then it was like, oh, okay, <laughs> but you should learn. <laughs> uh, let's see, what am I missing? Man, you guys are really rocking the questions today. I'm on downers. I, you know what? It must have been a few minutes ago and I've sailed past it, Matt. I'll just assume. <laughs> I'm assuming you're making fun of me. I'll just ride with it. I have pretty thick skin. Uh, thank you, Julia. Uh, yes, uh, Oliver Wolcott. I can, I, you know, don't go anywhere, Julia. Let's talk about Oliver Wolcott. So he was a delegate from Connecticut. Um, he was the son of a colonial, a royal governor, a colonial governor, 
kind of a temper, a temporary governor, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so he did go to Yale. He was one of the younger sons, so he wasn't necessarily destined for politics. But as a younger son, he did get into Yale, and he started making his way up through the lower offices. He was for a, a sheriff in Connecticut for a while, uh, fought in the French and Indian War, became a captain, uh, led men successfully. Uh, he was sheriff for like 20 years. Yes, 20 years as sheriff. Um, he was essentially the only police officer in his county. Um, he would eventually be chosen as a commissioner of Indian affairs for uh, right about when the American Revolution broke out. Yes, okay, okay. Let me say, let me get this back. Wolcott would become both a politician, both a, a, a politician and a general. Before the Revolutionary War breaks out, as I said, he had fought in the French and Indian War, and he grew into, eventually promoted to a general in the Connecticut, Br Brigadier General in the Connecticut Militia. Uh, again, before the Revolution, even during the Revolution, each state had its own army. They were called militias uh, and run differently than an army. It's not exactly the same. You know, I'm, I'm glazing over that. Um, eventually, he goes to the Continental Congress pretty early on. He... Uh, is chosen as a commissioner of Indian affairs, which was the politically correct name at the time. Um, and actually, I do believe it's still called the Bureau of Indian Affairs. <laughs> with all the PC, PC. Oh, oh, I'll grow up one day to hear my voice crack. <laughs> with all, all the PC talk today, um, it's still, you'd think they would have changed it to Native American like a century ago. Uh, but no, not so fun fact. Uh, either way, he is a delegate to the Continental Congress, negotiating with the Native Americans, running back to Connecticut to serve as a brigadier general in the military, eventually gets promoted to major general. Uh, he does, uh, he helps Washington, uh, of course, with the Continental Army. He returns to Continental Congress. He signs the Declaration of Independence. Excuse me. Uh, he runs back to New York to lead Connecticut troops in the Battle of Saratoga runs back to the Continental Congress to sign the Articles of Confederation, runs back to Connecticut, where, whammy, he's elected governor of Connecticut. <laughs> um, he, uh, and then, if I'm not mistaken, he gets, he's governor again? Oh, well, he's governor. That means, makes him commander-in-chief of the Connecticut militia. Uh, he goes and leads men in battle, though they're lesser skirmishes. Um, he goes to upstate New York where he, he negotiates with the Iroquois Native Americans and then he retires, as I say in my article, quote unquote, retires to Lieutenant Governor of Connecticut because, uh, you know, nothing much to do. Oh, I said things back. I, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm like looking out of the corner of my eye at my old article to remind myself. I said things backward a little bit. He didn't become governor until after he was Lieutenant Governor, which was after the war ends. He becomes lieutenant governor as the war ends and then later becomes governor. Uh, and he spends the last few years of his life as governor of Connecticut. So he holds literally every important position you can have as a governor of Connecticut. Uh, as a citizen of Connecticut. He's a signer of the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution. And his son, Oliver Wolcott Jr., just after the time of his death, takes over for Alexander Hamilton as the second treasurer of... Uh, second Secretary of the Treasurer. S Treasury Secret... The second Alexander Hamilton in the history of the United States. By which I mean, he takes over the cabinet position of Secretary of the Tre Treasury. The reason I'm twisting it around is I'm about to publish an article tomorrow about Thomas Tudor Tucker, who was a Treasurer of the United States. But that is not the same thing as Secretary of Treasury. It's very different. One works for the president, and the other works for Congress. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so yeah, the Oliver Wolcott is a, an extraordinarily fascinating person. And I'm pretty sure that the, Febu the video we linked to from February, I probably am not talking like this. I am not nearly as well lit. My camera doesn't look good. I'm probably talking like this. Although last February is when I started talking like this. So you can actually hear what I'm saying. Imagine that. Wow. What a novel idea. All right, Ashley, selling 300 copies, 300,000 copies was an impressive feat, not to mention the fact that way more than 300 people probably heard it or read it. Yes, it was super impactful. And what's most impactful about Thomas Paine, we're going back to that, uh, is his ideas. He really, his ideas inspired people, especially at a time 
when, like I said, Americans and the leaders in the Continental Congress kind of felt trapped. Like, what do we do here? There is a war going on. The king is not coming to help us, and it has declared that we need to be suppressed. What are our options here? France. <laughs> and Spain. Uh, that makes perfect sense. One reason folks knowing to read, completely overlooked. Yeah, no, it's all right, Joseph. Uh, Jeremy. <laughs> I was called you Joseph. Uh, yeah, this is... Uh, it's normal. He was referring to an old video of which you did look at. Oh, yeah. How am I downers? I see what you're saying, Matt. Thank you for clearing that up, Jeremy. Yes, I was very much like... I was trying to be like, oh, this is how history people talk. It's like, well, I'm very thoughtful. And it's, and it's like, nah, now I'm just going to talk really quick and entertain you while I talk about the American Revolution. And if I mistakenly say things wrong in my haste, I will make an addendum later. Like I did today about Catholicism. I, I did misspeak. And while I like to think it doesn't happen frequently, I'm sure it happens from time to time. Although that is often why I make you wait for a second while I double check myself. Like on Wolcott. I knew about Wolcott. When you said Wolcott, I was like, okay, he's the guy who was everywhere, right? He was like, uh, he, he worked his way up. He was governor. He signed the declaration. And then I pulled it up and I was like, all right, that's right. He was sheriff. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. I do think it's much better now. It helps that I'm not using my cellular telephone. I actually bought a real camera and a real microphone. <laughs> I have real editing equipment. I don't just hit record on my camera. <laughs> and then upload it, which, I mean, it worked. To be fair to me, Matt, you started watching while I was using my phone. <laughs> it's the content, right? What I actually heard is that it's the sound is what's most important. And Matt, you started watching right when I started talking loud and clear, which was the key. It is the sound more than the video that people care about. Pardon me while I sip some sips. Where are we at? 54 minutes? All right, we're closing in on an hour. It's not bad. Let's see. You guys pop in your, pop in your last few questions here. Let's see if there's any more questions. Uh, let's get some likes. There's 12 people watching. If we, we got seven likes. Can we get that up to 10 likes? It'll just make my whole weekend. My whole weekend. Not my whole year because it's pretty early on in the year. We got some time before that. <laughs> uh, let's see. Any other founders you guys want to learn about? I'm going to scroll down here and see if I link. Oh, I made this. I wrote about Wolcott a long time ago. I don't even link to another person in the Wolcott article. Who's at the bottom? Thomas Nelson Jr. Oliver Wolcott Jr. Oh, Erastus Wolcott. You know what? Let's talk about Ar Erastus Wolcott, who was a sibling of Oliver Wolcott Jr. that I remember almost nothing about. Uh, Erastus Wolcott, a, a while ago I offered a challenge to uh, Liberty & Co., who I, you know, um, ab absolutely love, <laughs> uh, and who sponsor our Friday uh, uh, giveaway. Uh, I asked him a long time ago, hey, pick, tell me out, man. Find a founder I don't know about, and I'll, you know, make you the sponsor of the article. <laughs> um, this is a very long time ago where neither, we were both new to the what we were doing. And he was like, how about Erastus Wolcott? I'm like, who the hell is that? Um, but he was a brother of Oliver Wolcott. Uh, again, their father was a chief justice and a governor of the colony. Um... Oh, no. Okay, I'm going to look that up. I wrote something here that I, I don't know if it's right. That his father was at the Albany Conference with Benjamin Franklin. Albany Plan of Union. Did I just stumble onto something I used to know and forgot about? Let's look at the delegates who went to Albany in 1754, which was the Albany Plan of Union. Wait, it doesn't have the delegates here. Oh, this is the plan. Okay, Albany Congress. In 1754, about the outbreak of the French and Indian War, there was a meeting of uh, people from several northern states. Uh, New England plus New York and Pennsylvania and Maryland sent some representatives. Uh, and they met to discuss the... Uh, the, the outbreak of the war and mutual defense. And they actually came up with a plan that looks a lot like the United States Constitution 33 years later. Uh, thank you, Benjamin Franklin. No, no. You know what I forgot to, you know what I left out? Do you know what I left out? You know who was at the, uh, that video? 
Oliver Wolcott. Oliver Wolcott Sr. that we were just talking about. I totally overlooked this. Somehow it didn't even make it into my article. Look at that. I, these articles, I try and keep them brief. I try and make a nice summation of someone's life. And this one I wrote several years back when I was new to it. So forgive me. Oliver Wolcott, before he was a signer of the Declaration, before he did this and before he did that, he was at the Albany Congress in Albany, New York, where, as we were saying, it's something. <laughs> now I'm going to go back. Sorry, Erastus Wolcott was his brother. He did very little. It was a very hard article to write. There is not a lot. He fought in a few skirmishes. Um... Yeah, didn't I? Okay, you guys are saying a ton of stuff that I'm missing because now I'm all distracted. Um, uh, in a sense, he published a majority of the... Yes, he was the propaganda of the time, Galloway. <laughs> uh, did Spain send soldiers and help finance the war? Unfortunately, we weren't taught much about Spanish part. Yes, I will get back to that in a second. Uh, I did a video about the Albany Conference, right? I thought so. Yeah, so the Albany Conference is really interesting because it's in 1754 and it's about, you know, defending British North America from French Canada. And they come together and they want to use, uh, Ben Franklin leads the discussion in this unification uh, of the colonies to a certain extent, which didn't happen. It was pretty much ignored by the king, but it would could have put off the revolution itself. But what's really interesting about it is this meeting in Albany is both who would later become patriots and who would later become uh, loyalists. You know, so you have Thomas Hutchinson, for example, was a loyalist, the royal governor, one of the guys who, like, kind of eh, started the whole violence in Boston, not on purpose. Hutchinson just had a lot of enemies who ended up being patriots. Sam Adams, uh, uh, Man, uh, man, names were evading me today. I want to say Isaac Lowe. No, that's New York. Um, Otis, James Otis. Uh, eventually Sam Adams. They really hated what this guy Thomas Hutchinson was doing. But he was there hanging out with Ben Franklin. Of course, Ben Franklin would sign the United States Constitution. But his son, William, was one of his staff members serving as a secretary. He would be governor of New Jersey and be a loyalist. Uh, Benjamin Shue, kind of in the middle. Um, but... Oliver Wolcott would sign the Declaration of Independence. I think one of the... Yes, Philip Livingston would sign the Declaration of Independence. Um, uh, is there... Was William Samuel John... Where's Connecticut? No? Okay. Sorry, I'm like glancing through with the names. Mashench Weir from New Hampshire would be a patriot. He wouldn't sign anything, but he would be a governor of New Hampshire during the Revolutionary War. Um, John Penn... He would kind of stay out of it because he was the royal governor of colonial Pennsylvania, or he would go on to be uh, royal governor and then kind of step aside. Uh, Stephen Hopkins from Rhode Island, signer of the Declaration of Independence. The the uh, Albany Congress is, I, I did make a video about it. Thank you for bringing that up, Matt. I know I did make a video about it. I should probably make another one just to go into a little more depth on some of these names. Um, William Johnson is not William Samuel Johnson. No, it's Sir William Johnson. Uh, from upstate New York, who was very important discussing with the Native Americans and treating with the Native Americans uh, in the colonial New York. And then he would pass away literally, if I'm not mistaken, like 1775? 1774, right, just before the First Continental Congress meets. So he's not involved in the revolution, but his son would be, and he would fight for the Patriots, and his uh, Joseph Brandt, who was a leader of the Native Americans and one of the Iroquois, would be, uh, I think <clears throat> Excuse me. Would be uh, Joseph Brand was kind of like an adopted son to uh, him. You just brought to yesterday, Matt. That is weird that we're talking about right now. Thanks for rewatching it. Hopefully, uh, it's probably my old setup, isn't it? Ah, I don't want to take any of that stuff down because it's good information. It's just not as easy to watch. Yeah, maybe, but I should make another one because. I was actually thinking about making a series of videos on like several steps towards independence, like this. I mean, obviously, you guys are asking about it. Maybe it would be a uh, a fruitful exercise. Because, um, yeah, the Albany Congress, in a weird way, is not against the king at all. Actually, the Albany Congress is more to support the king. Again, 1754, it's 20 full years before the first Continental Congress. But yet, what did I say? Three? Was there three? Four? At 
at least four signers of the Declaration of Independence, 22 years before the Declaration of Independence, all meeting in Albany, New York, with future loyalists, of course, trying to defend from an invasion down the Hudson River, if this sounds familiar, from Canada, only this time it was the Br them helping Britain and stopping the French. And protecting themselves. Because their a major concern was also the Native Americans. But it was also the messiness of having separate militias that were not aligned in any way. And, you know, when the Continental Congress forms the Continental Army, again, 20 years later, it probably would have been easier if they had already set up certain networks like Benjamin Franklin had been saying this whole time. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, we were running. We did just hit an hour. Uh, if there's any questions slowing down, we got up to 10 likes. Thank you, guys. I super appreciate that. Uh, it helps. The reason many of you found me is because other people hit like. So if you're hitting like now, maybe some other people will find us. Join our sweet team. Uh, if you came in late, again, uh, I put a link to our Discord channel in the bottom. Uh, they only last 24 hours, so sign up now. If you're not familiar, Discord is like a social media. Another social media, but this one is my own server. So... The link goes to Founder of the Day social media. And it's just people who are like this channel, who have clicked on the personal invite links from my channel. So we have a fun conversation going. We have a meme section. Uh, we have a general section. We have announcements where, you know, when I find out when Jesse sends me the Skylar Mansion stuff, I will definitely put that in the announcements. Um, I'm always open to questions. Like I said, if anyone's interested in tutoring or any kind of co consultation, I'm going to put that up later today on my website, but you can just email me through the email address down below. Of course, follow me on all the followings and all the good stuff. Uh, is my video on Joseph Galloway in your underappreciated founders list? I don't know. I made Galloway a long time ago. It probably is one of the crappy looking ones. Um, I... I... I Julia, yes. Oliver Wolcott Jr. would be George Washington and then John Adams is Secretary of the Treasury. Not Treasurer. <laughs> uh, and for uh, uh, Joseph Galloway, probably? Uh, I mean, I could pull it up. I'll put it in there. Let's see. Let's see how old it is. I, I'm really interested in... Uh, <laughs> really interested in knowing... Oh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to talk? Okay. Galloway. I'm really interested in knowing when, how long ago I did some of these. Because I started in September. Oh, think, oh man, you searched Joseph Galloway. I'm the fourth thing that comes up. No. Fifth. <laughs> oh, eight months ago. No, okay. All right. So it is an upgrade from April. Not wearing a hat or this shirt. Flags up though, so it's not too long ago. The flags up, <laughs> but my windows are not covered, so it's it's not good when the light comes from behind you. I've since learned. I'm always trying to improve this channel for you guys. Uh, you're related directly to Oliver Wolcott. That's amazing. Well, his uh, former buddy and then turned enemy uh, Joseph Galloway has a descendant on his channel also. That's pasted in here. Let's see, did that work? Did I do that right? There you go. If you're interested in whatever you're interested in, uh, I see people fading away. So let's call for the day. This was a fun study hall. I hope you guys learned something. I certainly did. I don't remember what. I learned a few things. Oh, I learned math. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming. Like I said, check out the Discord channel uh, to talk with the people you're chatting with on the side here. Most of the people chatting on the side are already there. So if you're not... You're having a good time. Please come over because it's essentially 24 hours a day you can access all of our friends here. Although some of us sleep. Some of us don't. <laughs> some of us do. Uh, thank you guys. It's awesome talking with you. It's awesome chatting. Feel free to stay in the chat as long as it lets you, which I assume is a while. Um, I am going to cut it off here, but uh, have not come out with a sign off for study hall yet, but uh, I'll come up with something that's not stupid. <laughs> We have sign-offs for the other days. I don't know. You can keep on keeping the keeping the stuff. <laughs> All right, guys. I'm going to go. Thank you so much. And I'll be back with another founder for you.